introduce our first speaker, uh, Dr. Roger Anderson, Professor of Natural Sciences at Columbia University Teachers College and a Senior Research Scientist in Biology and Paleoecology at Columbia University. Uh, his research areas include microbial ecology in the oceans, estuaries, and Arctic tundra. Uh, he has published widely on radiolaria, microscopic protozoans that are now migrating from the tropics into Arctic waters uh, as the oceans warm. Radiolaria, by the way, also are the subject of paper sculptures in Voyage of Discovery. Roger is the recipient of many career honors, including the Japanese Paleontological Society Medal and Bermuda Biological Station Award for Marine Biological Research. Uh, please help me in welcoming Dr. Roger Anderson. Yes, uh, ladies and gentlemen, I'm very pleased to meet with you today to talk more particularly about the scientific aspects of radiolaria, but also initially to at least address some of the aesthetics. And now looking at it, I'm not so sure the real world is as elegant as what the artists can do, but we'll have to remember these are single-celled organisms and given their due respect. I would like to particularly talk about them in terms of their elegant uh, aesthetic qualities, but then get into their role as indicators of climate change, particularly in the high latitudes and in the Arctic. But if you look at this, for example, these look like little glass sculptures. Indeed, they're a form of opal or a silicate deposit from the oceans. Think of it somewhat like a colorless sand grain, but molded in these most elegant forms. Uh, some look like a teardrop pendant, others like an urn, perhaps. Uh, this one with a beautiful ray heliodiscus. No one looked like, looks like one of the beautiful sculptures I saw the artist render. And all these things, remember, are produced by a single cell. The DNA of a single cell produces these. Now look at this. <laughs> this is a single cell organism that starts off with a cell inside here. It makes a tripod-like structure. This is no larger than two-tenths of an inch. And then it elaborates this remarkable engineering structure around it. Uh, you can see I-beam and lattice structures, which any engineer would appreciate, I think. Uh, and we did engineering analysis with finite element uh, analyses on this base, and it's as strong for its dimension as any bridge we would build. And remember, this emerged millions of years ago by evolution. But within this single cell in the center, it elaborates out a frothy kind of uh, pseudopodial mass and literally molds each of these components sequentially until it produces it. Now, Ernst, Ernst Haeckel, the eminent biologist in the 19th century who found many of these in the ocean, uh, named this genus Calamitra, but this species is Emmy, because one of his wives was named Emma, and he thought it was so beautiful, how else could he <laughs> give it due credit, but name it Emma after his beautiful wife? And I think he was perhaps wise to do so, right? <laughs> Look at uh, this case. Now, this is a living one. That was the skeleton. Uh, this one has a frothy bu bubble capsule whereby it floats in the ocean, and uh, this is the frothy pseudopodial mass uh, that actually has ammonium solution in there because it gives it buoyancy, but it can't be compressed. And notice these algal symbionts. Very commonly, the tropical ones in the surface water have these. It's basically a little farmer in the sea. It captures these dinoflagellate uh, symbionts. Uh, they photosynthesize, and I use C14 uh, tracer studies to document that these fix, just like plants do, uh, carbon into organic compounds, and they translocate these into the host, they can provide a substantial part of the nutrition for this organism. So as long as it has the right temperature of water, the right light, it can uh, subsist quite successfully just on the little uh, plants it has managed to uh, uh, bring into its cytoplasmic mass. Here's another one of a different genus. Here's the central uh, glassy part, but you can see all the uh, pigment inside of the cytoplasm, and then these rays of uh, spine-like uh, cytoplasm sticking out are just filled with these symbionts, all of which are producing the photosynthates that it uses for food. Uh, in this case, now, if we look where they grow, it's important in the science I'm going to talk about. We know for several centuries, actually, that radiolaria dwell at various depths in the ocean, some of those with the symbionts are clearly surface water dwellers, particularly in the tropics and subtropics. Uh, they require the warmer water in the surface to maintain their symbionts and their lifestyle, if you will. 
The sunlight provides the energy for photosynthesis a little deeper down, less sunlight. There are some which are adapted to the deeper water, lower light intensities. Their algae are particularly able to grow in that light intensity and temperature. And then finally, even in the abyssal depth, which is much darker than I've shown here, we have some that are growing very cold water, adapted to those uh, uh, conditions in the deep sea, and they have no symbionts, of course. So overall, uh, the irregularity have adapted in evolution over many millions of years to take on certain environmental uh, niches, we call it, uh, where they can live and dwell. And therefore, the temperature of the water and the conditions is very important to them. Indeed, uh, because of that, radialaria can be considered canaries in the mine shaft for changing oceans. Because, for example, if the temperature of the water warms considerably as it is, as we heat up the atmosphere due to our CO2 emissions, which are trapping the heat, some of it goes into the ocean. A lot of it's going into the ocean. And if the water layers start warming up, then this one, for example, may have to descend to a lower depth in order to survive. What's going to happen to its symbionts? If it's not getting enough light, the option, if it can't adapt, is it will go extinct or no longer be present. That would be an indicator to us in this particular water mass, climate is doing something. So they act like indicators in the living environment, but also because these skeletons are very stable, they've contributed to the sediments over many millions of years, and the scientists, some of which, whom I work, have been looking at the cores down deep, and we can look at the changing climate these have recorded in the sediment, because if they're warm living, you'll find warm ones down there if the ocean is warm, and if they're cool living, you'll find cool ones when the ocean is cooler. And so we want to ask ourselves now, what is likely happening presently? Well, one of the research we did, published in the Journal of Micropaleontology, along with uh, Dr. Bjorklund and Dr. Kruglakova, was interesting because we found in the Arctic Ocean, up here very high up uh, on the top of our globe, that uh, we found uh, subtropical and tropical radiolaria, warm water radiolaria living there. We assume they're living there because we found juveniles. And how did they get there? Well, the Gulf, Gulf Stream regularly carries water, as you know, from the equatorial regions on upward. But normally it sinks as it uh, cools and uh, becomes more saline. But occasionally something happens, it's abnormal, which it did just several years ago and has continued for a while. These waters are unusually warm. And the normal subpolar gyre, we call it here, which protects the Arctic Ocean, breaks down. And then this warmer water invades. And when it invades, it can bring in these uh, subtropical radiolaria. And we found them there living quite well, apparently. And the real question is, since it's very recent, only the last several years, Will they then become a part of that ecosystem? Maybe that will be a healthy thing. They'll add diversity, or maybe it won't be so good, because they may outcompete other ones that are there that over millennia of time have become the major parts of that ecosystem. So we're in a balanced situation here to figure out what is this going to do? Will they become a dominant part of that plankton or not? And it's all due to the changing warming conditions here. And for example, in this part of the uh, western part of the Arctic Ocean, it is under the most uh, great impress of warming. There's a considerable abnormal warming in this portion con consistently right now. So the question comes in, what are the consequences of all this? Well, for millions of years, or thousands of years certainly, there's been a regular cycle of the Arctic Ocean that it freezes over almost completely huge ice sheets on the surface in the winter, dark, cold winter, then in spring comes, it begins regressing and melting. And as this process takes place, a very important environmental factor over thousands of years has developed that during the winter, it traps nutrients in the ice along with some dormant microorganisms like algae, the green algae. When it starts melting in the spring, as it should do, it uh, seeds the ocean below from brine channels here where the algae and nutrients get very free and active. And then these organisms down here provide food for other uh, uh, plankton, particularly the radiolaria. This cycle is critical to the ecology of the Arctic Ocean. And unfortunately, the ice sheets have been regressing each winter because of the warming water. And this cycle, so important to our 
uh, Arctic environment and then to our whole global climate because the Arctic controls the uh, 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 global climate quite significantly, both in terms of the atmosphere as well as the ocean circulations. As this is changing, it's a very serious matter. The fact we found these warmer radial area up there is an indicator something is happening. More importantly, uh, more recently, Dolan et al. in Acteprozoologica looked at the plankton in the Arctic Ocean between 2011 and 2012, when coincidentally there was a major decrease in the sea ice at that portion of the ocean. And as you might predict, if there isn't any seeding, because there isn't enough of this melting, there was clearly early evidence that uh, the radiolaria were greatly affected. They were smaller, dramatically reduced in number in 2012 compared to 2011. And thus, there is early evidence from the radiolaria that normally dwell there that without this normal cycle of the sea ice seeding the ocean, they are systematically being uh, suppressed, apparently, in their growth. And thus, you see another indicator. On the one hand, warm ones are coming in. On the other hand, others that normally live there are under duress. So generally, as I say, the radial area are one form of the canary in the mine shaft. They're showing us something is happening. And we can conclude then, since I only have 15 minutes, even though <laughs> they've been around thousands of years, <laughs> I hope we haven't uh, gone too quickly. We can conclude two things for this talk. One is the elegant, artful, even forms of these uh, radiolarian skeletons give clear evidence the remarkable evolutionary diversity and creativity of life that the DNA, even in a single cell organism, could produce those beautiful structures that we show here, the artists have rendered so elegantly. Uh, and it is amazing, I think, even to a scientist, that the power of this information molecule over evolution has become so capable, really, of, of being diverse in its creativity. And finally, then, the current research evidence shows that radial area are sensitive to global warming. They can serve as early warming indicators to the extent to which uh, global climate change is taking place, especially in the oceans and most markedly in the Arctic, where incidentally we're seeing very vast changes both on the solid earth as well as in the seas. And uh, significant changes are taking place there, as they pointed out earlier. The melt, uh, thawing of the permafrost, I look there at the microorganisms that grow there, they are becoming very active. They're putting out more CO2 as the warming takes place. And the warming is definitely going into the oceans. The surface temperature is going up. And that's apparently one of the reasons why we've had a somewhat stalled increase recently. As the oceans are taking up that temperature, it's going to come back out. And eventually, then, we would predict increased global warming in general. So the radial layer are telling us something, and we'll have to keep reading what they're telling us and hopefully come to some conclusion about the events that are taking place and, as humans, what we're going to do in response to it. Thank you very much.